some might be <laughs> um, So we're continuing our journey that we started this, evening, this morning as we're thinking about God gradually revealing himself in an ever closer um, relationship with his desire to walk with us, to be with us, to commune with us, to know him personally, and to share that intimate relationship of love that we all crave with him. And just to pick up from this morning, we started with the sad story of God's coming to walk beside his people, his first two people, Adam and Eve, in close communion in the first garden. But they distanced themselves through their rebellion, through their sin. When we then started the journey back to God, dwelling with his people, walking with them in a close communion and a knowledge. As through the Old Testament, there was a, a rapprochement, a coming closer, a coming nearer. But it was only in part. It was a promise of restoration and redemption, but only in shadows, only in pictures. And we were left crying out for a, a reality of something better, of something more real. So to complete our journey this evening, I want to start by reading some relevant Old Testament type passages that we find quoted in the New Testament. And we see that this is a continual journey. Reading through the, the, the Hebrews, one of the things you'll notice is how frequently the Old Testament is quoted. Um, it is all part of the same story. And so our first reading is from Leviticus 26, 11 to 13. I will make my dwelling place among you, says the Lord, and my host shall not, uh, and my soul shall not abhor you, and I will walk among you, and will be your God. And you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their slaves. And that is picked up and it's quoted for us in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians 6 16. God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. We thought a little bit this morning about how these Old Testament promises were. Um, only partially fulfilled in that Old Testament economy. And it left us feeling disappointed. But the New Testament writer here reassures us that he who promised is faithful. Hebrews 10.23 The promise still stands. The promise will be fulfilled. And it will be fulfilled beyond our wildest hopes and expectations. God will dwell amongst his people. He will walk among us. And he will be our God. And the second pair of verses is in Jeremiah, quote, quoting when Jeremiah is quoted from chapter 31 and verse 33. For this is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God they shall be my people. And that passage in Jeremiah is actually quoted twice in Hebrews, first in chapter 8 and 10, and again in chapter 10, verse 16. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their heart, minds. I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And so these second start set of verses, that uh, this, the Old Testament and then it's being re-quoted in the New, it starts to open our hearts and our minds to the why, um, to the how question. What has changed? What is it that moves us from the shadows to the reality, from distance to closeness, from fear to confidence? Well. You know the classic Sunday school answer to every question, don't you? <coughs> Jesus. It's a good shot if you're not sure. Well, to this question, it is absolutely the correct answer. That is what's changed. Remembering again from this morning, Hebrews 1 and 1. Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke 
to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. God's making himself known. God's revealing himself. God's making himself known has been transformed by God's eternal redemption plan. God has taken away that distance by coming here again and walked among us. But now as the living eternal word, Jesus himself. John 1.14, the word, Jesus Christ. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we've seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Or in other words, as the King James translates Hebrews 2.6, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the Son of man that you visited him? You see, God so passionately desires and desired to be known, to walk again amongst and with us that he became a man. And he did just that thing. He walked our dusty roads. He tasted hunger. He knew tiredness, pain, and disappointment. Just like we do. And being a man, he shared our every experience. Hebrews 4.15 For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So here, we were left this morning with this, this distance and the strangeness and the darkness and the fear. But then John records in the first verse of his first epistle, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, we have seen with our eyes, we've looked upon, we've touched him with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we've seen it. We testify to it and proclaim to you eternal life which was with the Father, which was made manifest to us. So those words in Hebrews, God has spoken to us by his Son. He's, it's so rich, it's so full. It's taken on a whole new reality, a whole new nearness. He does really want us to know. He really does want us to trust and to love him. <coughs> and then the how that we get from Hebrews eight and ten quotations, which also restate Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put in you. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live. The detail, this detail is vitally important. To know God, to have that close relationship restored to daily walk in his presence, to know his knowing acceptance of us and his love, to know and taste that. We need two new things. We need a new heart and we need his spirit within us. Only the Lord can do those two things. When we come to him and seek his face in humble repentance, those are the two things that he will do. He will renew our heart spirit come and dwell within us only he can do those things and it's that that breaks down the barrier to the nearness and relationship with a holy a fearful God yet a graciously loving God the, the, the barriers are removed are broken down and if we journey back to Mount Sinai and the fear and the trembling the impenetrable smoke and the cloud or if we travel back to Mount Zion, to Jerusalem and God's temple with its heavy impenetrable curtain, hiding God from us and keeping us at a distance in the fear of death. One man once a year with a blood sacrifice. And we contrast that to now. A new heart. And God dwelling not amongst us. true closeness. That is what God has done and desired for us. And how can that be? 
that God, a holy God, could dwell within our sinful people. It's the same Sunday school answer. Jesus. Yeah, absolutely it is. Matthew 27, 50 to 52, and when Jesus had cried out again with a loud voice, as he gave up his spirit, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, the tomb was broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. The writer to the Hebrews picks that up and clarifies it in chapter 10 and verse 19, uh, verses 19 to 22. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Jesus Christ, in that perfect, sinless sacrifice of himself, shedding in his blood, his shedding his blood in our place, that is what opens up the access to God. That's what tears apart that curtain. That's what turns that distance and that fear into, into love, into, into closeness. As a proof on that day when he gave his life in our place, the actual physical curtain was torn from heaven. Access one. Not once a year. Not by one man. wherever, whenever, every day. Hebrews 10, 10 to 11, and by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Every lamb, every bull, every goat, every dove that was ever sacrificed, totally unnecessary, totally redundant, that once and for all perfect and finally effective sacrifice and that one perfect eternal high priest who lives forever in our Lord Jesus Christ. No more court of the Gentiles. Whosoever, whosoever will may come. That I trust is explains a little bit of the how and the why we can be reconciled to God. How our fear and distance can be transformed into closeness and confidence. Did you see those words in Hebrews 10? The contrast with Mount Sinai. That's the point of that beginning passage. Sinai was darkness and fear and trembling. And now we have confidence. We're told, draw near. We're told to draw near. Because of Jesus Christ's death for us, paying the penalty for our sin, and his bodily resurrection, meaning he lives forever. No more darkness. No more distance. No more ritual cleansing. No more blood sacrifices. The Lord himself has come incredibly close. He has made himself fully knowable. He does walk beside us. Ever our journey might be looking like today or tomorrow. He is dwelling within every one of us who's trusting in him. But, there's always a but, isn't there? <laughs> but, Jesus Christ has once for all reconciled us to God. And that once and once for all sacrifice. But our journey, as we said, is marked by ups and downs and highs and lows. Feelings of nearness, but sometimes feelings of distance. And our experience of knowing and walking with the Lord is bleak. We know in our heads that we now have free access to the very throne of grace, day and night, whenever, wherever. We know the truth that he is with us always and everywhere, even to the end of the world. Uh, even to the end of the world, if you believe in him. 
We are constantly reassured of him dwelling in us by his spirit. But then sometimes, too often, if we're honest, it just doesn't feel that way, does it? It just doesn't feel like the very Lord of all creation is dwelling within us. But you know, in his grace, the Lord, he knows that. He understands that. He gets it. He addresses it. It's not what he wants for us. He doesn't want us to be feeling that way. But he knows that we do. And he knows that that is our experience. Each one of us. For example, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. For now, we see in a mirror dimly. But then, face to face. Now, I know in part. But then, I John, who had seen Jesus with his own eyes in the flesh, he tells us in 1 John 3, 2, Dear friends, now we are children of God. What we will be has not yet been made known. But we do know that when Christ appears, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Yes, the relationship has been restored. Access has been won. The curtain barriers have been torn down. But even now, in the best of times, when we feel like the Lord is walking with us there, it's still not the full reality of what Christ has purchased and what God has promised. Our final garden, our final city, paradise. That garden of rest where we will have un. near a constant pleasure presence forever Hebrews brings us the, the, this concept is in the word rest God's eternal rest Hebrews 3 verses 17 to 18 and with whom he was provoked for, and with whom was he provoked for 40 years was it not with those who sinned whose bodies fell in the wilderness and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest those who are disobedient. And Hebrews 4 and 3, for we who have believed enter that rest. For the children of Israel, if they'd been rescued from Egypt, there was the promised rest and the promised land, but through disobedience they distanced themselves. God's promised rest for us in the new Zion and the new Jerusalem, or the garden of paradise, of paradise as Revelation describes it, describes heaven. That this is really important. God's rest, paradise, heaven, it is not defined by a physical place or a location. It's not geographic, but it's by the promise made way back in Genesis 22. I will. walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. With unhindered sight and knowledge of our ways, unveiled eyes, no distractions, no cloud of fear or care, no distance through the tears of trials and tribulation, no sin coming in and blinding our vision, spoiling our freedom. There, hearing his tender whisper, seeing his nail-pierced hands, feeling his loving, complete acceptance, knowing his perfect love. That is paradise, that is the last city, the final Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. Revelation 21.3 describes heaven this way. And I hope it will chime with us. And I heard the voice of him on the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them as their God. Finally, the full fulfillment of every reality 
We do, however, have a journey to make before that is our forever reality. We don't know how long or how dark or how stormy that journey of ours might be. We have the reassurance of the God who is faithful to his promise and cannot lie. But he reassured, reassures us for the journey. Our new heart is forever new. His covenant of adoption his promise of his indwelling spirit is forever sure. His desire remains unchanged through the whole story to walk with us the path of life towards himself. As we approach the end of today's Bible journey, a very brief, quick journey through our two cities, our two mountains and our two gardens, let's finish with two verses from the concluding book in our Bibles. Revelation. Firstly, chapter 2, verse 1, where Jesus says to the Christians in the church in Ephesus, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven count lampstands. There then, like here now, Christ himself walks beside those of us who make up his church. His beloved bride, knowing and wanting to be known. And secondly, in chapter 3 and verse 20, where Jesus gently whispers to each of us at all times, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in to him and eat with him and he with me. I said this morning that the thing Andrea and I most enjoy is walking beside each other and enjoying each other's fellowship and close intimacy. And the thing that we probably enjoy most with our friends is to sit around the table and to share fellowship over a meal and conversation together from a beautiful picture. And he would come and he would join us and sup with us. From Genesis 3 to Revelation 3, the Lord's desire has been and remains forever to walk with us and to commune intimately with us. Through the sweep of the Old and New Testaments, God's evolving revelation and redemption work has been to draw us back, to draw us near. So if and when there is distance, it's always on our side. When there are or seem to be barriers between us and God, it's always from our side. When we cower in fear and shame, it's always from our side. When we don't or feel we can't run to the throne of grace, it's always from our side. So I want to finish with some questions for us to ponder at our leisure. What can come in and block our communion? What, what barriers do we erect between ourselves and our Lord? Have we any real reason to doubt his faithfulness? What is it that we feel we cannot share with the all knowing? When and where do we make time and create quiet head space and heart space to walk and talk with him, to hear his voice? What can you and I do to change any of that? I'm not going to leave you just with empty questions. I'm going to leave you with some truths to take away from tonight, from today. James 4 and 8. Draw near to God. John 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just. He will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. As we sung earlier in Psalm 46, be ye still and know that I am God. For 
to Jesus himself in Mark 6, 31. Come with me away, come with me away to a quiet place and rest a while. And Hebrews 4, 15, and we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, but without sin. Draw So I trust that's a blessing for us that we would seek his face through every circumstance. He is faithful to his promise. He is true.